A very warm welcome to the House Beautiful, where we are celebrating the publication of the House Beautiful edition of The Wildium in January. It's a wonderful thing for us to be able to come together in Constance's drawing room, welcoming all the contributors to that issue, art and letterpress, as they used to say in the Yellow Book, with only a few exceptions. I must begin by thanking our hostess, or rather our hostesses. Karen lives in this beautiful flat with Andrew, the former drawing room and smoking room, across there. And Jen lives in the ground floor flat, the former dining room and Oscar's study. She has very kindly invited us to see her flat later. So let's start off with a big round of applause for the two current Chatelaines of the House of yeah. The January issue of the Wildium is the biggest ever, but it wasn't planned to be like that. More than a year ago, Rob Marland, who's with us today, sent me his article on the base relief plaque of Isola created by Irish-American sculptor John Donoghue to celebrate Oscar's sister, who died at the age of nine, and who is forever commemorated in Oscar's beautiful poem, Requiescat. I realized as soon as I read the article that it was an important contribution to Wildium scholarship. And the most astonishing thing about it is the revelation that the plaque still exists. Its current owner, Father Liam Quinlan, has travelled all the way from Connecticut. He's standing in the door over there. The dog collar is here for me to bring the plaque into this room for the first time in 129 years. So do not leave today without asking Father Liam to show you the plaque. Coincidentally, I then received two more articles on the House Beautiful. The first was Devon Cox's article about the erection of the blue plaque on the front of this building to, in 1954 to commemorate the centenary of Oscar's birth. The second article was by Anne Anderson, with us today, on the way in which the dado became the symbol of the aesthetic movement, or daidocracy, as Punch <laughs> wittily called it. By an almost incredible serendipity, this was going on at the very time when Karen's architect, Ralph Eichelberg of London Atelier, who is with us today, was uncovering Oscar's original colour scheme devised by the architect E.W. Godwin in this room and in the bedroom, the former smoking room, to reveal the dado. <laughs> the dado is the green mm -hmm. yes. on, yeah. going around the wall. It's a high dado. A <laughs> high art dado. <laughs> it, it, it still seems almost incredible that we can see the actual positioning of the three Whistler etchings by the door in a frame specially designed by Godwin. They're, at, they're mainly behind that chest of drawers, but uh, uh, you're going to see a shot of, of the wall in a minute. So I had three long articles with many illustrations, and the most sensible thing for me to do as editor would have been to spread them over three issues. However, I felt they really needed to appear together because they complement each other and give us a view of the house beautiful that we've never had before. <coughs> this was an expensive process, not only in terms of the printing, but also the postage. So I had to take the proposal to the committee. For the last three years, the Wild <coughs> has been accessible on JSTOR, the database of academic journals. All articles back to issue one are accessible free of charge to anyone who belongs to an institution which subscribes to JSTOR, which is virtually every university and college 
in the world. Every time someone downloads an article, we receive a royalty. This is an unexpected addition to our fund that we could never have anticipated even two or three <coughs> years ago. So the committee had no hesitation in deciding that these additional funds should be ploughed back into a wild deal, hence the bumper issue. So now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have our first treat of the day. I'm going to introduce to you Ralph, who is going to give us a short talk on the restoration of this flat. Ralph, where are you? Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, actually, <clears throat> it's less about this flood. It's a little bit more about the flood from downstairs <laughs> and the mistake which was made there. Um, <clears throat> so in 2011, we got engaged there as architects and interior designers to develop um, this flood. But let me quickly jump back in time to um, 1970s. Um, at that time, this house was owned by the council, and it was actually a bad set. It had about 12 rooms, and it was um, equipped with two bathrooms, and a greedy developer, possibly, I would say, um, uh, has bought this house, divided it up into five floods, and uh, each of those floods was more or less uh, yeah, equipped with two bedrooms or three bedrooms, <coughs> and was sold on then individually. And uh, when we engaged on the development um, downstairs at ground floor, we discovered basically still the, the, the setup which was done at, at that point in 1970s. So, and no, so this was the layout. So as you come in, you have the hall basically, and you can see um, you, you have those two bedrooms enabled where the second bedroom is so small, um, well, it was a developer trying to, to sell off, basically. But I would like to draw your attention onto this little area here, which later on became, after our strip out and finding a suitable scheme for, for um, our client at that time, um, we, we discovered something quite interesting. So in, in principle, we took all the partitioning out, which was also here still evident um, in this flood, but we took those, those partitionings out and enabled this room as a large kitchen and a living room. And going through here, there was this connection established, but we tidied it up and rearranged basically the bathroom and the bedroom, which was uh, Oscar Wilde's former study. So now looking at the next picture, uh, this was what we found at that time, exactly in that zone. And behind this plasterboard wall, it, at that time, the building was already listed, but um, it was all um, uh, clad. So the suspend, there was a suspended ceiling in, in place, which we took out. Now, the next picture shows you um, basically the findings. And you can see there were remains of the existing plaster and the paintwork also visible and evident and the original corners. Now going on to the next picture you can see those lovely lovely colors which we have managed here with the car to preserve and restore to, to, to some extent. They are actually present downstairs and unfortunately unfortunately <laughs> our client at that time um, has decided to, to basically to paint over. Now, during this renovation, this, this little um, pink triangle, uh, um, square which I was showing earlier was actually re revealing this little arch here. This arch was a, a fantastic feature and we did actually a, a, a scheme around those, those colors, the colors which like, were loved by Oscar Wilde. We, we found in some areas actually this, uh, this golden color um, which was uh, connected to, to the corners, which was uh, found in, in the actual study. But here you can see the client has decided, okay, let's paint all over, and unfortunately, everything is lost. Uh, but it's, 
it's still there. So if if uh, if actually somebody <laughs> is trying to, to to reverse it, so that was the whole principle of preserving what's there, but uh, but unfortunately it was all painted over, and and Khan luckily has well we. We convinced, her, uh, we convinced her not to paint over and have a very different approach to it. And this was now a picture from downstairs, um, which we took. And you can see here the arch again um, with the lovely kitchen and everything. So it's still a very nice scheme, but I think it's not used to the full extent. So, you, so there's more. And now I would like to, to finish off with this wonderful shot, which is part of your, your bedroom and the glazed door. And you can see this wonderful color scheme. Um, yeah, a fantastic project. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you, Ralph. Now, in his article about the plaque erected on the outside of this building in 1954, Devon Cox makes the point that the 1950s was just about the worst time to be a gay man in this country because we had a Home Secretary who had an absolute thing about the cancerous spread of the filthy vice of sodomy. So you can draw your own conclusions from that. Only four months before the unveiling of the plaque, Alan Turing, who played a significant part in the Allied victory in the Second World War by deciphering the Enigma Code, committed suicide after he had been convicted of gross indecency, the same offence as Oscar's, and sentenced to chemical castration. So erecting a plaque to the most famous homosexual in English literature was a bold thing to do. When Devon was doing his research in the files at English Heritage, he came across a poem that had appeared in the New Statesman by Carl Granston, who was standing outside there in the rain on that morning in October, wondering how many more men were going to be hounded for their sexual orientation and then hailed as heroes after their deaths. I said to Devon that the poem was so beautiful we had to try to include it in his article, but it was still in copyright. Devon managed to contact Carl Granston's daughters, Catherine and Deborah, who are with us today, and they very kindly gave us their permission to reproduce it. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you the president of the Oscar Wilde Society, Giles Brandreth, who is going to read the poem to us. Thank you. Very good. Before I read the poem, very briefly, I need to salute the editor of the Wild Union, yes. which has always been a wonderful <laughs> now, This is not only the biggest issue, it's the best issue, and it's a real achievement. And it's, but what I love about uh, the Oscar Wilde Society is we are both scholarly and accessible. We do fun things in intentions, we do scholarly things in the Wildian, and uh, it's been a brilliant, you've done a brilliant job, and it's thrilling to have the, the authors of the articles and the illustrators here with us today. It's also wonderful that the, the two girls who now uh, <laughs> occupy the ground floor and the upper floor are, are here. And I particularly like the fact that Karen has a, a dog that is called Lily, which I think uh, Oscar Wilde would have approved of, given his enthusiasm for Lily Nation. Lily so that is marvelous. Is it a girl dog? Or is it she a, is Lily. She is. Oh. Exactly. <laughs> because otherwise it hadn't been called Bosie, we'd have been very surprised indeed. Uh, I'm going to read this poem now. Um, um, I ought to explain, I am the president, the proud president of the society. I'm also the biographer of the late Sir John Gielgud, who Michelle, who is here today, and I were lucky enough to, to get to know. And I think I'm right in saying, Devon can correct me, that he was the original person that they wanted to uh, have unveil the plaque. But he then wrote to uh, the family, to Vivian Holland, and saying it really wouldn't be appropriate now, because in 1953 he was, as, as we know, uh, arrested and charged for cottaging. So he sort of with, withdrew. And then they had great difficulty in finding someone to unveil the plaque, and eventually Compton Mackenzie agreed. Uh, as well as being the biographer of uh, 
John Gilbert, I do a podcast called Rosebud, with obvious uh, reference to the Orson Welles film, uh, Citizen Kane. But I interview uh, the great and the good, interesting people. One of the people I've recently interviewed is Merlin Holland. It hasn't yet been broadcast, but do, do go to Rosebud online and look out for the conversation with Merlin, because he talks, he, he remembers, uh, 1954, 53. In fact, he remembers 1953 vividly because he was actually at, not just at the coronation, but he was in Buckingham Palace on the coronation day because his mother, the wife of Vivian Holland, was the Queen's makeup artist at the time. Uh, uh, you would have thought that would have made quite a story, actually. Oscar Wilde's daughter in law uh, conducts, uh, you know, does the makeup for the Queen on coronation day, but they rather kept that side of it quiet. Um, but anyway. Uh, he talks very interestingly, and in, in, his, in his book, it's going to, I think going to come out next year after Oscar, we'll all be able to read the detail, the first-hand detail of how this came about. So here we are. This is a poem written by somebody who was 29 at the time, uh, K.W. Gransden, of whom I knew nothing, but I did know that he had written a biography of E.M. Forster, because it's one of the many books that my wife is wanting to put into the tip. Um, <laughs> we're going through slight uh, tensions worry. at the moment. Um, she's wanting to clear out everything. The skip is ready. She's told me you might as well do it You're now. She says I'm going to be. In. She says you'll be nicely cushioned because your jumpers are going in first. <laughs> so this is the poem. It's a, it's a lovely poem. It contains a line that has troubled me about. Um, uh, 50 years in Reading Jail. It, it's a metaphorical line. I think we just take it with a great sweep. I think it's not 50 years. It, it's obviously meaning beyond the time that uh, Wilde was, between 1895 and 1897, in prison. And uh, it isn't 50 years since then, but it's just a turn of phrase. It's thrilling for me to meet the, the two daughters. Um, and do touch their garb later. They didn't actually know Oscar, but between them they met almost everyone. I mean, the, the, the taller one there, I think when she was a little girl, Ian Foster sat her on his knee. It's quite safe, it was Ian Foster. Um, read Baba the Elephant to her. Uh, am I right? Yes, yeah, absolutely. He visited my father in um, um, Primrose Hill, which That's is where they lived. Um, and was before it, it was posh, it was, was cobble it streets. Is it Edith Sitwell that was a posh? Edith time? Sitwell, KT, yeah. and yes. Okay, so so they, they are over there, and feel free to sort of <laughs> shake the hand. Uh, I, I've already sort of I'm rubbed the wallpaper, so some of the DNA will come off. So this is a very exciting occasion, and I'm very happy to read this lovely poem. It's called Number 34, Tight Street, which is what the address was on October the 16th, 1954. Of course, in the days when Oscar and Constance lived here. The number was 16? Correct. Correct. Okay. In the grey October morning, we stood in the crowd at the back, outside the house in Tite Street, to watch them unveil a plaque. Ironically, now enveloped in, of all things, a Union Jack. We looked at the house in Tite Street, tall and ugly and red, and thought of that sheriff's auction and wondered what he would have said when his long-veiled name was unveiled again among Chelsea's respectable dead. We welcomed him back to Tite Street, the victim of English laws. For 50 years in Reading Jail is enough for any cause. So we clapped to see justice done at last. He was always fond of applause. And we hoped that in that audience there were no other men to whom we could bring such a ruin, and then undo it again, by unveiling, 50 years after, a little blue plaque in the rain. Oh. Thank you, Charles. That was very beautifully read. And thank you also to Catherine and Deborah for allowing us to print it. Let's have a round of applause. Thank you. Now, I have another treat in store for you. At the risk of causing you to spontaneously combust with those hard gem-like flames which old Walter Pater used to talk about, we've been invited by Jen, who lives downstairs, to see Oscar and Constance's dining room and Oscar's study, in which he wrote the picture of Dorian Gray. 
When we were, oh, first of all, this is Father yes. Liam. Oh. oh, with the plaque. Oh, show us the plaque. Oh, oh, oh my gosh. Oh. oh, all the way from Connecticut. Now, when we finish here, Father Liam is going to put it on the top of the, the unit in the hall. So as you go down to Jen's flat and back again, you can all have a close look at it. Do we know how he got hold of it? Can we hear how the miracle happened? I sort of was actually. Um, I've said mass at the at the high altar in Saint Germain de Pre, oh. where Oscar's requiem had been held. I also said mass in the suite at l'hôtel mm -hmm. to uh, to remember, on, on supposedly his desk. Um, but I I've, I've always felt very very connected to 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 Oscar Wilde. Um, he's uh, he died on my brother's birthday. I remember so. We, we were kind of like, well, an odd sort of a person to have involved in, in, in our lives, in a sense. But being Irish-American, my mom's from Galway. My, my poor mom is, uh, she's moved recently and she's suffering a bit. But she said to me, well, oh, the Wilds were Galway people. <laughs> Which I think is an interesting take on Oscar Wilde. <laughs> but um, at any rate, uh, I became, I, I read several biographies, and I've seen an element that, um, that Oscar had spent, had, had a luncheon with this young um, Irish-American sculptor called John Donahue. And I said, oh, I wonder who he was. So I started researching him, and well, Rob brilliantly found my, some of my research. I actually did kind of a, a historical, looked up his ancestry and that sort of stuff. Um, I ended up being able to actually to buy a piece of his artwork, and I was quite delighted. I visited his grave, which is in Connecticut, and I was then contacted by the man who had sold me the, the artwork I had, a sculpture, and he, um, he said to me, you know, I know of someone who actually owns another piece of, of, of artwork by Donahue. Do you think you be, might be interested in it? Sure, why not? I was at a canon law <coughs> convention, which is what I do for the church. Canon law is kind of dreary, it's law, but uh, I do that. I was out in California. I got a call from this woman in Florida. She said that her father had had collected, had, a, had had an antique shop in Larchmont, New York, which is in Westchester, um, outside of New York City. And she had now his things, and one of them was a plaque with the signature of the artist, and it seemed a quote from a poem by Oscar Wilde. Oh, interesting. I'd like that. And I remember thinking, as uh, not the, we, we uh, parish priests aren't paid all that well, and I wasn't even a parish priest at the time, I was working in the chancery. But it was, as to my mind, expensive, but I wanted it. So I bought it sight unseen. And when I got back to Connecticut, it was there. And um, this was it. And I thought, well, this is very interesting. It's very pretty. And I began researching it and looking and it was then that I found out that, you know, that there had actually been a, a plaque hanging over his, his fireplace, yes. fireplace. The mantle, above the mantle. And, um, but I thought it didn't really mean an awful lot. Um, I wasn't, I, I was certain that this was nothing and I have to apologize. I, I had my framer actually glue it to a, a surface so that uh, it would hold because it was difficult to actually frame. I had thought of, when I'd learned about that, of putting a, a frame around it as it would have been, but I thought, well, that's kind of crazy. Let me just do it like this. Um, just, I, I'll, I'll keep talking, because I'm. this is what I do for a living. <laughs> <laughs> it is, isn't it? Yeah. And I'm back, but unfortunately, I'm sorry. Well, you're going to place it somewhere, so we can all go and... Yes, it, it'll, be, it'll be outside. outside. Yeah. So you can all see. So Thank yeah, you. presentation. Thank you. Now, when we were putting Rob's article together, we went to a certain amount of expense to recreate this end of the room with the plaque in place. Rob went to the v &A, got the drawings of the overmantel and everything. So we were able to create this exact view of what it was. And I've had two art prints made, one for Karen, and one for Father Liam, oh, show, showing, oh, that's showing the Good actual basing of the plaque over that 
from. And is this the deco as we think it would have been? Yeah. In the um, simple colours and the light shades like this? Uh, absolutely. And uh, Rob, uh, can you tell us something about leather and feather? Because oh, yes. this, is, this, is something, this is something that puzzled me for years. Oh. This was the controversy. I mean, some people who've described what this room looked like have talked about these. Can you see these two coloured panels on the ceiling? This is something called Japanese leather. There's a type of wallpaper handmade in Japan, and it was, uh, it was made to look like leather by embossing it um, against real uh, leather. And there was uh, dragons painted on it, and people described this. And some people were confused at how it was done. Some people say that Whistler painted them, but that's not the case at all. But there are also some accounts that say it wasn't leather, it was feather. But I think I was able to fairly convincingly show in the paper, and if you read it, you can agree or disagree. But I think it, that the idea that it was feathers was a typo. I think someone wrote down leather, and I thought, that sounds weird. Leather on a ceiling? That sounds odd. <laughs> feather. Feather sounds like Oscar Wilde. Peacock feather. It was a peacock feather. So, but I, um, I think it's fairly clear now that it, there was no uh, feather in the ceiling. It was, it was these uh, leathers, paper leathers, with the dragon design on them. And as an editor, I would just like to say that shows how important proof is. Because I've read umpteen accounts of feathers stuck to the ceiling. And I thought that would have looked dreadful. Anyway, we've got I've got one of these for you for a very important event took place in this room. One day Oscar was working at his desk when his young friend Lionel Johnson turned up to see him. Lionel Johnson was an Oxford undergraduate and poet. He already knew Oscar and he brought with him his friend Lord Alfred Douglas. So they both came into this room and Oscar was of course immediately smitten by Lord Alfred and we all know how that ended. <laughs> So Lord Alfred uh, claimed that he was obsessed with the picture of Dorian Gray. He bought a copy and read it 10 times. So he was desperate to meet the author. And as Lionel Johnson knew Oscar, he was able to affect the introduction. Lionel Johnson was also a very great admirer of the picture of Dorian Gray. And he wrote a poem, which Ian is going to read us now. Ian is the book reviews editor of the Wildian, and he is the Mr. Chips of the Oscar Wilde Society. <laughs> <laughs> he teaches Latin and Greek, and the poem is called In Honorem Doriani Creatorisque Eos. Now, Ian did offer to do an English translation, but I said there's no need. <laughs> <laughs> so here is the Latin version. Um, I wonder before I begin if I could have a little more light. Is it possible to put the light on? Um, just behind you there, I think. Don't want one. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So um, when I was preparing for this, I looked at the Latin and I thought, this is very odd. I was trying to make it scan like classical Latin. It wouldn't scan. Then I noticed it rhymed, which is unheard of in classical Latin. <laughs> um, and I now realise this is not classical Latin, it's ecclesiastical Latin, which makes sense because I think... Lionel Johnson had uh, converted to the Roman Catholic Church just before he wrote it. So I have had to learn a new pronunciation for this. And if I start pronouncing it like classical Latin with V's as W's, then I will abase myself. Then. <laughs> Beg for forgiveness. In honorem Doriani creatorisque eius. Benedictus is Oscare, qui me libro hoc dignare propter amicitias. Modo modolans Romanu laudes dignas Doriani. Ago tibi gratias. Juventutis hic formosa floret inter rosas rosa. Subito dum venit mors. Ecce homo, ecce deus. Si sic modo esset meus genius misericors. Amat avidus amores miros. Miros carpit flores sebus pucritudine. Quanto anima nigrescit. Tanto facie splendescit, mendax, sed quam splendide. Hic sunt poma sodomorum, hic sunt corda vitiorum, et peccata ducia. In excelsis, et infernis, tibi sit qui tanta cernis, gloriarum gloria. Lionellus poeta. All this is Latin for a thousand times. 
<laughs> In honor of Dorian and his creator, bless you, Oscar, for honoring me with this book for friendship's sake. Casting in the Roman tongue praises that befit Dorian, I thank you. This lovely rose of youth blossoms among roses until death comes abruptly. Behold the man, behold the God. If only my pitiful talent could be like this. He avidly loves strange loves and fierce with beauty he plucks strange flowers. The darker his spirit, the more radiant his face, lying, but how splendidly. Here are apples of Sodom, here are the very hearts of vices and sweet sins. In heaven and hell may they be glory of glories to you who perceive so much. Lionel the poet. Omnia ex und mille gratiarum Anglicae. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.